Uh, my name is Anna Apich and I'm running uh, Institute for Sustainable Tourism Good Place based in Slovenia. And I will be your host also for this second um, workshop with the focus on um, cooperation between DMOs and the public sector. Um, we put it a question for this presentation. Uh, how do we go from destination serving to tourism to tourism serving destinations? And we are going to talk about a lot uh, how the DMOs should work closely with the um, um, with private sector and supporting them in getting certified through different uh, motivations and through different um, part to different uh, projects. So um, to guide you through a little bit, just how this whole workshop is going to look like. Uh, first of all, we will have a small presentation, a short presentation, a half an hour presentation from my side. I will present a little bit of our experience from Slovenia Green. And then we will have a very interesting panel discussion um, of, uh, and uh, three other participants are joining our panel discussion. One is going to be Ingrid Sorens, which who you are already have met now. One is Milena Nikolova, and the other, uh, and the third one uh, is Asta Christine Sigurion's daughter. I hope I pronounced it, but I'm sorry, Asta, if I said it wrong. Anyway, um, through the whole um, section of this workshop, you have the post questions, please put it into the Q&A section and we will go back to them uh, once uh, we come to the panel discussion. So let me now just um, start with my presentation. I hope that it, oops, I'm sorry. Um, I hope that everything is uh, working and that you can see it. Um, so uh, as I said, we put it the question on how to move from destinations serving tourism to tourism serving destinations. I think it's a little bit provocative question on how to uh, how we could actually start thinking outside the box or start thinking a little bit different from how we were addressing tourism in destinations until now and what the correlations between the destinations was um, and how it should be in the future. So as we know, destinations have their natural and cultural assets which are attracting tourism to come to destinations. On the other hand, we have businesses, private sector using those assets and providing amenities to serve the needs and the interests of the tourists. And then of course, we have the tourists coming to the destinations to fulfill their expectation or travel around. And of course, that can create a lot of positive impact. It can create, of course, the impact on climate change as we saw today in the presentation of England. And it can also create a positive or negative impact on the local communities and the resident, residents living in the destinations visited. This is the, case, this is the picture from close to Slovenia. Uh, and it's a very new development, building the biking route meant for tourists, of course, mostly. In, and this, but on that, in that process, destroying the landscape of the beach, which was before used both by locals and residents for you know, summer, summer vacations on the coast and, and swimming and so on. So it is a question, you know, who is actually losing and who is winning, who is serving who? Is this really the right way that we actually take all the, um, you know, we want and on the account of nature, on the account of local residents, just to develop tourism and thinking about this is something what tourists really want. Yeah, no, so I'm sorry to really interrupt you. We don't see your slides yet. Could you try screen sharing again? I'm sorry. Uh, oops. Now, can you see them? Uh, I'm sorry, but. Jana, if you can click on share at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I saw, I did that. And share your slides. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I will just 
sorry, but I was sure this was working. Now you can see it? Yes, absolutely, clear. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry for this, um, but yeah, this is where we started and we were talking about nature, nature with uh, serving tourism and um, nature also serving as a provider for, uh, for, for tourists and for tourists visiting the destinations. Coming to this, how is this actually really, is this really the right way forward and can we justify those actions? So um, going to like Slovenian uh, case, we said that our, our vision for tourism, Slovenia is a global green destination for discovering visitors looking for active and diverse experience, tranquility and personal benefits. So we have tourists in the center and the question if, is this is enough or do we need an extra focus on, on other stakeholders also in the destinations? So can tourism actually serve destinations and stakeholders at the same time? Or how, how should we actually reshape our new vision? We saw a very good example today of Ingun and the national strategy for Norway, Norway which uh, they presented in this year. Um, and I think this is the right shift in going forward and changing this um, approach in the national st strategic planning. So going back to the roots and asking ourselves, can we use certifications to contribute to this change? And I definitely think this is a very uh, needed actions. Um, and this is the part where we talk about engagement in the private sector. So if we are asking us, ourselves this question, how can we shift this perception, perception of tourism serving destinations, we definitely need to think about from destinations in service of private sector or to private sector in service of destinations. So how to bring this private sector on board? One of course is for motivation, for certification, and bringing all, all the benefits to private sector and the destination uh, through support and education. Mm, what can a destination do for private sector? But also on the other hand, the shared what can private sector do for a destination? In the promotion, of course, those actions joins in the same in the same direction. Uh, going to our experience of uh, Slovenia Green. Our Green Scheme for Slovenian Tourism, it's a national pro program for sustainable tourism development and a certification scheme for Slovenia Green. Um, and in this um, approach, we are trying to kind of uh, set three pillars of how to develop sustainable tourism. One is, of course, through this certification program and development of Slovenia Green, which is going through inviting destinations and private sectors to join the Slovenia Green program. Um, the mayor or the director signs the green policy, so it has an, an impact on how they actually perform. We offer education and support, certification, evaluation and recommendations once the certification is finished. And destinations and businesses need to constantly monitor and develop further and implement all those new uh, actions. For that, a number of development and tools are um, in place, uh, developed by the Slovenian Tourism Board. So on the other hand, so that means that we are actually, of course, creating the background of uh, sustainable development. But when we are talking more about this cooperation between businesses and local and destinations, we kind of need to think also about other steps and other pillars. We need to think about the green offer because through the green offer, um, this, this, these businesses can actually connect themselves in the destination and build an added value for the tourism. So how can we do that? Building on a story which actually is connecting the green destinations and private sector and developing local experience added value for local communities and thinking about also CO2 footprint, soft mobility, mitigation and offset of course, and uh, building a cooperation on all levels. For tourism, this actually will mean that the experience they will get is going to, to be added uh, an additional factors of satisfaction and additional factors of getting involved in these local communities, in these local experiences. And also we can do that to try, trying to 
shift the default setting of, of tourism in, in making it more, more green and making it easier um, for the visitor to, cho to choose the green, um, the green solutions. So in the first part of certification, I'm not going to go to the certification of Slovenia Green because this is um, something uh, which we were already discussing before, but it's a national certification program uh, supporting destinations and private sectors. Uh, it's using, we, are, we didn't develop it like uh, in Norway could develop their own standard, which was recognized by the GSTC. GSTC uh, mostly GSTC recognized standards, for example, like green destination for destinations, travel life uh, and others for businesses. Uh, by now, we already have almost 60 destinations being certified. You have to know that Slovenia is a small country and 60 destinations is quite a good number for us. Um, and that means that in destination level, we have like 40% of all municipalities in Slovenia are certified. But that means that 80% of arrivals in Slovenia would already happen in certified destinations. This is also regarding the accommodations, the numbers are going up quite high uh, from the year 2015 when we started working on this certification program of Slovenia Green. So how to actually engage the local businesses um, more into the, this process and how to make them sure that they are on board? Um, one thing, of course, is going through the standards. There is a number of things and a number of activities that business these destinations need to do in cooperation with the business. We have to motivate them, how do we have to educate them on different criteria and so on. But one thing which we added um, to, to this uh, process is that destinations, even though they perform well, um, they would not be able to get a certificate like Slovenia Green Gold or Platinum if they don't, wouldn't have at least one Slovenia Green accommodation in their businesses. Because we kind of believe that you cannot be a certified green destination unless, unless you give the tourists the opportunity to really stay in one of the certified accommodations. And of course, to bring um, benefits to the industry to show them what actually will mean once they engage in a certification, how they will lower their costs on one side and how they will increase the satisfaction of both employees and guests on the other side. Another thing on the national level, uh, there is a number of supports going to the businesses and uh, getting them engaged. Like each, each business can get uh, co-financing from the ministry um, when they step in the certification program. Um, and uh, a number of funds, national funds from the Ministry of Economics for the Slovenian tourism, there would be a key measure saying that you cannot be eligible and get at less unless you are certified as a Slovenia green business. Uh, at the moment, we have a few tenders out for infrastructure in tourism. And uh, key measures on that part are especially given to co cooperation with local supply chain. Uh, and what is introduced also now is for accommodation. They need to think about shared space within the hotels and shared experiences and places for, you know, at least some access, at least some uh, services which will be. Uh, mostly targeting them as well. So it is like trying to build um, this bridge um, through, the, through the business, also through these um, different uh, motivations and incentives through different fundings. And of course, the additional promotion to the Slovenian Tourist Board, as Slovenian Tourist Board being the owner of the Slovenia Green, they definitely uh, support and um, motivate businesses even more to join so they can include them in different um, business, uh, in different promotional activities. The other thing um, in the last year in the COVID time, we introduced the new roadmap of Slovenia Green, uh, deciding that there are a different subjects in the Slovenian tourism where we need to uh, have a specific goal and a specific focus on them and to work even closely with both local communities, destinations, and especially businesses. Those three themes are single-use plastics and waste, how to reduce single-use plastic in tourism sector, and of course, how to reduce waste. 
how to introduce short supply chains uh, in the travel sector, you know, how to bring closer the demand and the supply within the local communities and how to engage local communities even stronger in the planning process. Also in Slovenia, in the, in the, in the process of certification for Slovenia green destinations need to do surveys between inhabitants, visitors and businesses. And this part of local communities is part of the information which we get from the surveys from destinations. And what it shows and how this whole green, uh, green uh, ro roadmap uh, is being structured is that, for example, for the plastic, um, single use plastic, we want to ban single use plastic from tourism and reduce uh, waste, uh, especially food waste. We have we set it a few KPIs on those subjects. Um, uh, the same on the supply chain, how to, to, how to uh, develop those links uh, closer between farmers and hotels and other producers in the destinations and how to increase the satisfaction of local communities. All these KPIs are very closely linked to the businesses because there is where the change needs to happen. So a number of uh, workshops, educational programs and also supportive material for the businesses is being provided so that they can get on board with these activities. The other thing where um, the uh, green scheme is being more active in the last year, Slovenia was, uh, is still a, a gastronomic region, uh, European region of gastronomy in 21. And that means that we tried to even stronger influence to introduce green and sustainable gastronomy. Uh, we did that through two different uh, activities. One was that within the asset planning and assessment um, platform for green destinations in Slovenia, we added astronomy, where we specifically target the questions on how are the destinations working closely with the businesses and supporting them in this task of being um, more sustainable when it comes to gastronomy, uh, how the local brands and the quality brands in destinations are being developed and how the um, businesses are getting involved. For the businesses, on the other hand, we also introduced Slovenia Green Cuisine label so that even restaurants can get certified um, and get the Slovenia Green label. Um, they can do that through two, two different primary certificates. One is um, Leaf from Canada and the other one is Green Key uh, from the Netherlands. So these criteria, especially focusing on destinations, is trying to build a closer cooperation with locals, with producers, and especially focus, focus on local quality brands. This is an example from Bochin, is a brand, Bokinsko from Bochin, which is really promoting local producers um, and uh, bringing uh, them closer to, to the tourism. It's done in a holistic way. That means that producers, they really have a, lot, a, a number of small manufacturers who are producing, um, I don't know, pipes, for example, or different craft products. And um, now we, they have a specific team behind of designers and support center where they work with those craftsmen and try to help them recreate their product and make it interesting for tourism. So the local quality brands is being really strongly developed and is now covering everything from culinary and coming all the way to the accommodation and experiences within the destination. So it's really working very closely with all the stakeholders and all the businesses and even local, small local producers in the destinations. Um, the other pillar which uh, we find very important is when working closely with the businesses in a destination is how to develop a green offer. What does they actually mean? Is that um, Slovenian Tourist Board introduced, this is one project, introduced the Slovenia unique experience, um, trying to motivate businesses and destinations to create a unique and authentic and premium experiences with added value, with low carbon footprint and added value to the, um, uh, and create um, uh, different, prom different products um, supporting the promise of green and boutique Slovenia. It's on the level of, um, 
of a tender every year that people, that destinations and businesses can apply for this label of unique experiences. And on the other, on the other hand, we have a Slovenia Green Association, um, which is association of certified destinations and businesses, and they work together on cooperation, joint development, education, and marketing. And one of the activities which uh, Consortium Slovenia Green was doing in the last year was especially developing green routes, meaning destinations and businesses on a specific topic through the specific uh, story and bringing and developing uh, a holistic um, experience and and product. So this so now we have a, a number of Slovenia green routes and Slovenia green products uh, with a specific um, um, focus on businesses and destination being certified how to minimize carbon footprint, avoiding single use plastic, and uh, all the participants uh, sign the code of conduct, um, and we are selecting authentic stories through this cooperation and building um, Slovenia green products. Um, in this year, we created Slovenia green gourmet route, which was one, of course, supporting the the idea of Slovenia being a gastronomic region of Europe. And uh, through that, we created a gastron uh, this, uh, actually it's a biking route, which is also partly connected to trains. So it's like totally um, low uh, carbon footprint um, tour. And on the other hand, with this kind of um, approach, we are really seeing the increase on one side of this in businesses, understanding that this is the right way to go forward um, and the right way to actually having additional motivation on getting on board with all the activities in, that Slovenian Tourist Board is doing for the Slovenia Green. So that means that only once those who get certified, who get involved, are also included in product. We see, on the other hand, once we launch those products, that there is a huge interest also from um, from the visitors. Um, it is like, as I said, it's uh, in the form of, um, of biking routes throughout Slovenia on different topics. So that means that you can download the GPS track and go by yourself, or you can actually um, hire a guide, or you can do it uh, through the travel agency. Uh, the interesting part was that we saw a really huge interest in media side. Uh, once launch, launching those uh, travel products, um, especially like Lonely Planet, totally picked it up, um, uh, and a number of other um, different um, journalists around the globe. So we also saw that now that, that, that uh, a number of um, requests are coming in uh, for, for people trying to book their holidays, especially on those routes, because this I believe is one of the one of the ways how to actually reach the goals which Ingun was um, talking about, um, decreasing the carbon footprint through specific pro products, which are really carbon footprint minimum, um, small or even neutral, and um, really adding on added value to this experience for the guest um, and getting them on board increasing their added value and bringing all the local communities and the businesses within um, in this product and making them understand their role in it and also making them getting them more motivated to understanding and to actually get on board the whole Slovenia green pro program. So as I said at the beginning, going from uh, from this basics of certifying businesses and destination is the first step which we need to do to make sure that we are not greenwashing that we are we are actually doing actions and making sure that both destinations and businesses evaluate their performances and they build on those performances and trying to make their offer and their and their management and their performance even more sustainable once they do that we need to think about how to connect them into the added value for the visitor and make sure that the visitors understand what is the value of such sustainable products. And we see that um, through our experience now that visitors are really picking that up and they really appreciate those approach. 
And of course, through that, we can reach the visitor and make sure that the way they travel throughout our destination is the way we want them to travel out throughout our destination. You know, that lower their footprint, their negative impact, and try to really make sure that they add value to all the parts and to the, all the stakeholders within the destination. So I think this process is really very important. And this is where the whole structure of cooperation between destinations and businesses um, can um, come to life. So tourist is actually becoming an invited guest in our destination. And um, we have this um, um, uh, director of one of the two of the destinational of one of the DMOs from Bochin. Uh, they're our first platinum destination and he always describes their destination as a living room. You know, you have your living room and you invite your friends over to your living room and you know who you want to invite. You're not going to invite just anybody, but you actually to completely know who you want to invite, who you want to have there. And you definitely know what, how you want them to behave. And if you, if I'm as an invited guest to a destination or to, to a living room of my friends, I will definitely um, feel that I need to behave in the way that he wants me to behave. And that I appreciate this invitation and that ev all the state and everybody in the living room has a great uh, experience um, through this visit. So this is one of the, uh, one of the aspects of one of the steps, how to actually see the tourist as being part of this, as being part of this process and getting on board also with your strategy. So, to move to the panel discussion. Um, I was trying to make this uh, presentation short and sweet. I hope it was, uh, it was interesting. Um, and uh, I would like to leave as much room also to the panel discussion because I think we have really great um, panel, uh, panelists on our, uh, in our panel. And um, when we were going through this uh, talk with them and trying to find the right discussions, how to make, how to actually guide this whole process and where are those cooperations between the businesses and the, and the destinations going on and how to actually try to answer that question of how are we going to go from destinations serving tourism to tourism serving destinations and to making all stakeholders on board with the same goal. Um, we were thinking about three, three different questions. Every, one was, of course, bringing everyone, everyone on board. I think this was a big challenge for Norway, um, you know, introducing such a different approach on strategic planning and talking about uh, how how to guide your destiny, your, your, how to set the goals and the measures in the right way, saying, okay, we are going to, to minimize um, carbon footprint. I want to add value to tourism um, and to all stakeholders within the tourism. That actually means a lot of compromises on all, for all stakeholders, especially for businesses, as it was already popped one in one question, you know, how are they actually, um, how is the Norway going to retarget their um, visitors? Um, that will bring a huge impact, of course, on how the businesses can start to get along those um, uh, that strategy. You know, because uh, we all, everybody, will need to do their share, and they are part of the of the job if they want this to work. So this is one question: how to bring everyone on board especially when it comes to introducing a little bit um, uh, measures and KPIs, which are in some, to some extent, maybe in conflict with business as usual. So how to get them on board and make them understand and uh, support the same vision. The other question is how we bring added value to local businesses, but not only the businesses in tourism sector, it's, uh, we have a really interesting case uh, from Iceland um, who invited local businesses, but not tourism businesses only, 
you know, to think about how can tourism actually add value to their business, uh, even though they're not focused on tourism, you know, what can tourism actually do for me? Um, and how can, how can a small business or any business in a destination profit for that? And uh, how this bridge can be um, actually mm, crossed. And the third question, uh, which I always find a little bit fascinating is that we would see a number of promotional activities going and asking and saying, you know, to visitors, come to our destination and feel like at home, which I don't totally understand because why would I want to feel at home? I would stay at home if I want to feel at home. But anyway, this is the message we can come across. And we, of course, try to make visitors feel welcomed. We try to make them feel good in our destination. But what if we would ask locals that we want them to feel like on holidays um, when staying at home you know why not shift this question again a little bit and start thinking it out of the box and making locals our um, our prior our primer or not primer but one of the stakeholders which we are addressing also through tourism services uh, we see a number of interesting cases on that, and we were really talking about that quite a lot for this, um, in this panel, you know, that business that addressing locals, we can actually maybe target some of the challenges um, that business that the tourism is having, like seasonality, or, you know, for example, we can see in some remote destinations, uh, which are poorly through, through transportation, that building transportation for visitors can long term also um, answer the question for locals and, and so on. So this kind of build, building, seeing the locals as one of the tourism stakeholders in that aspect also that we can develop services for them. I think it's also one of the interesting questions which we can address. And in our dis the, uh, discussion, there was a really interesting uh, comment from England saying, you know, that holidays is not a destination, but it's a feeling, you know, and you can have that feeling uh, in any kind of destination where you travel to, or you can even have it at home. So I think those are like three main um, questions, which we would, which I would like to talk with, with our panelists. And so let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Ingun Sorens, uh, which you have met in the previous workshop. And in case uh, you missed that, I would just like shortly introduce Ingun and say that she's working for Innovation Norway, uh, the Norwegian governmental organization for innovation and development in industries in Norway, including tourism. Her work includes policy development measures and incentives to increase sustainability within tourism in Norway. This includes development and implementation, a national standard for sustainable tourism um, and uh, all the system tools and instruments. Then we have Milena Nikolova, Chief Behavior Officer of Behavior Smart and co-founder of Be Smart Nordics. Milena is a leading expert in applying insight about human behavior to solutions in sustainability and travel. Her passion is in exploring ways in which behavior smart tactics can enhance the positive impact to travel for people, companies, and places. In the last years, she has been a frequent speaker at global and regional tourism industry events on topics such as behavior economics for tourism, innovation dynamics in travel, and new traveler consumption platforms. She is the author of the first book that explores the potential of applying knowledge from behavior science to strategic issues in the travel industry. She is also the founder of Boutique Consultancy focused on behavior smart innovation for tourism and industry. And last but not least, Asta Kristin Sigurons daughter is the CEO of Iceland Tourism Cluster, a business driven organization with members from all over the value chain of The cluster for 
business and value creation with within worked with companies for of all sizes for the last 15 years focusing on business development and innovation she has worked as a business advisor in one of the national banks a manager for development and innovation for central of east um, iceland she's currently managing the tourism cluster on a national level she also sits on a board of the tc8 net network the global cluster organization and works with various cluster managers in all kinds of industries globally so um we will start the uh, the the section with with questions um, and comments, of course, uh, which can come from you. So you are free to post any questions and comments in the Q and A questions. Otherwise, I would like to thank you for this first part of attention, and I will, we will move um, to our panelists. I will kindly ask our panelists to switch on their videos and um, their audio, audio so that we can actually communicate um, easily through this, um, through this uh, way. Of course, I think we all are kind of tired of all the Zoom uh, communications and hopefully in the future we come back soon and um, do it differently. But anyway, this year we are in this form and I think we can still have a very interesting conversation with our panelists. So first, I will go back to you, Ingun, and ask you the question which we were, you know, juggling around in our discussion before, you know, how to get especially businesses on board once we are introducing this which is in our strategic planning, which will definitely infect them. Of course, if we say that we want to target, we saw in your presentation, for example, how, um, how high uh, CO2 footprint um, can some, some visitors produce. And if we want to say, okay, we want to lower that, that will of course impact our um, aviation, uh, our cruise ships, which we were addressing before a little bit. So that will actually mean that businesses will have to think about how to shift their business as usual and um, approach maybe different markets, if that, is, if that is of course the right way. And also how to do it, you know, how to make them come on board and how to make them say, I, this is the right approach. I know that you struggle a little bit with that as well, but I hope that you have some good examples you can share with us <laughs> um, and how this process is actually going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So please do explain this part. Uh, you want uh, you want some solutions for your strategy, Jana? Uh, that's. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's it's. It's always a challenge to get everyone on board and, and, and in some issues you will not, not get anyone on board, but you need a reasonable number of uh, supporters and, and then someone will use much more time. What was quite timely for us, I think, is was that we have been working in this sustainable destination scheme for quite for, for, for 10 years soon. Uh, and so, so some are quite prepared. And if you go slowly by slowly, it seems to be you, you make some advocates uh, that really are speaking up and, and they will uh, have their voices heard. And, and we have tried to build on those voices uh, to a certain mm. extent. And I, I think that's quite important. Uh, and if you want a, a practical advice <laughs> is that <laughs> when, the, when the strategy uh, was finished, it is in this size, but it, it was made a huge, huge strategy that was too big to be put in a drawer. And then there was a campaign <laughs> traveling around the country and said, 
too important to be put in a draw drawer and it could mm. not be put in a drawer and then they had a, 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 a trip around the country and the different uh, dmos and and, uh, and private enterprise they could sign and they could kind of uh, create a support that is more like a, a kind of a marketing campaign for a difficult theme but but still it's uh, it's uh, it seemed to be quite a clever way of doing it and they were posting all the the pictures and their support so and of course it is difficult themes and 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 we have also got some quarrels and maybe some enemies or light uh, enemies uh, for uh, for a while uh, so so this is not uh, especially climate issues is very difficult sustainability broadly is softer everyone feel that they can kind of uh, apply it's not so so uh, so heavy but uh, as soon as you put up the climate issues more obvious or more uh, upfront, mm. it, is, it is harder. As we could see in the questions in crews, in, yeah. in uh, yeah. airplanes, cheap tickets for flights. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. But, but I think we, we we can't we we can't say that we have to stop something. We have to say that we have to do things may be differently mm. or we have to change some steps of the way yeah yeah i totally agree with you and um, when um, we had a discussion with milena who uh, is one of our panelists um, and as a very interesting um, thought came up which i kind of would like to repeat is that you in in norway you kind of opened the doors i would say to this kind of strategic planning and saying we need to address plan and you did that through the process of participation of everybody getting on board of saying yes this is the goals this is the kpis we want to we want to reach and uh, we've been doing the same the same exercise in slovenia and we are coming up with the same more or less similar kpis but now we have a second question you know which is just as important is to get all the stakeholders on board and ask them the question how to do that you know what can i as a tour operator or, or as a hotel or whoever change in my behavior or in my business to actually reach and support this, this vision. So um, I was really interested, Milena, going back, going to you now um, about this, our discussion, which I really find very, very interesting that this is actually really now the, the next challenge we, and I really like that, you know, Norway and Slovenia, we are doing the same thinking about the strategic planning. And I'm sure that other countries will more or less go into the same direction. But we can actually join these experiences and learn from each other and now do steps further also together. Um, but with Milena, I would like to ask her, you know, going to this um, difficult question of how to lower CO2 footprint from tourism industry, you are developing an innovative approach of thinking about, okay, as we saw, 75% of CO2 footprint is done in, in transportation, mostly coming to the, to the country or to the destination. Um, so if we have like 20% or maybe 10%, uh, which are the, the CO2 footprint, which we can actually lower through different kinds of activities, how can we do that? Milena, I, will have, I would like to give floor to you here because I know that you have um, thinking about, you have been thinking about that a lot. And yes. Yeah. This Please is actually share. one of the, uh, thank you, Jana. It's really a fantastic pleasure to be here, um, especially among these colleagues and friends. Um, so one of my favorite topics, especially in the, um, current context where all of us are, of course, feeling the pressure of having to, um, to transition to 
much greener and um, climate friendlier operations, but at the same time, recognizing that the crisis has left the industry really in a resource constrained situation. Um, one of the, the things that I feel is an opportunity, it's almost like a treasure chest that we are missing, it's right next to us, um, is to mark a start towards um, uh, net positive and uh, uh, carbon neutral operations by focusing on how can we change the way that we behave within the current infrastructure, technology, policies, and so on. Because we all recognize that we have to uh, make changes in the long term um, with infrastructure, with policies, with models, with technology, right? But many of these will take a very long time to, to come to reality because they're expensive, because they require innovation, because they, they physically wiping out an airport and replacing it with a carbon neutral one is, is, is just not as easy. But what if we can start walking that first mile within these physical and systematic uh, elements by tweaking the way that we use them, the way that we interact them, the way that we um, engage with them. So this is where this behavior smart and human centered solutions can really be tremendously helpful. So instead of, uh, and one of my favorite um, uh, examples actually comes from the airline industry uh, from Virgin, uh, uh, Virgin Atlantic, which um, a few years back were trying to lower their emissions, uh, the uh, environmental footprint of their flights. Um, and what, where they started was with um, encouraging, offering pilots small encouragement to imply very simple and very easy to execute fuel efficiency um, uh, tactics during flights. And over an eight month experiment, the airline not only uh, managed to actually optimize the environmental footprint of flights, but it actually ended up um, saving a huge amount of costs. So this is a perfect illustration that if we actually open that treasure chest and look at how can we adjust human behavior, we can perhaps identify these golden opportunities to use some small tweaks and, um, and achieve environmental and climate goals, but at the same time, also perhaps even save resources and do it in a very cost-efficient way. So, yeah, great, thank you. This is, I think, it's a really nice combination of putting these things together, you know, saying we have the goals which are smart and which are really, you know, being on the right track as we know, and um, Norway, this can be done, um, but then actually starting to tell this big, you know, monster in the closet uh, <laughs> called the CO2 footprint from the travel industry uh, with everything what we need to do, getting business destinations on board, shopping for solutions, but showing them, you know, that there are also small things which we can introduce now and make the change start to happen. And I think this is really important because, you know, if I always say that you need to have, whenever you want to persuade somebody, you need to have a carrot and you need to have a stick, you know, because <laughs> if you only have a stick, it will not work. You know, everybody needs a carrot as well. So if we show them and we guide them through that, then, then you know, people understand as Indian said, you know, we have, uh, been preparing businesses and destinations through certification now for such a long time. So they are to a big extent already on board, but to do that shift, it will still take time. It will still need to have them really understanding and showing them that with small, it can start with small mm, steps. And here I would like to go to the case of Iceland, you know, and our third panelist, um, Asta, and um, I was really, as I said before, I was really impressed uh, when Milena actually was um, uh, telling me about her experience in Iceland recently, 
and uh, you took them around Iceland and showed them uh, examples of businesses who like are not involved in tourism, but were given a question, how can actually, how can you benefit from tourism? Is there something that tourism can do for you? And I think this is a really smart question to ask, you know, businesses out of tourism, because I think that a number of very creative and innovative ideas can come up, which can increase the um, experience of the, of the tourist, but can also add value, as we were saying, you know, how to add local value, not only to tourism businesses, but also to local communities. So I would really like to learn, to hear about your, um, you know, your experience, Asta, and how you came up with that, with that approach and what is, um, what is the result now? Yeah, thank you, Jana. Thank you so much. And thank you for trying to pronounce my uh, la latest name <laughs> also. You did a really good job at it. Uh, um, I'm sorry. I, I no, 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 it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it when people try uh, and, and do it, actually, really good. Um, actually, when you say that um, we are, we are, you know, uh, reaching out to companies that are not normally um, you know, no thought of like in the value chain of tourism. I always say that everyone is in tourism. You just don't know it yet, you know, what, what your role, role is. So, uh, and now it's my turn to convince them how they are a part of this big puzzle that tourism is. Because of course, as we all know here, tourism is quite complicated. And I think actually that the pandemic maybe showed many companies how they, depend on tourism and and how they are like involved in so many ways i mean we see the fish industry in in iceland it it kind of collapsed because no one was uh you know buying fish in in paris or or you know so many different ways of of putting this into perspective in 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 that um and and we have always from from the start when we started with a tourism cluster in 2015 and, and formally uh, in 2016, we have always looked at the value chain of tourism really in a, with a holistic approach. Uh, we have on board not only the tourism operators and tourism companies and what you normally would say was tourism industry, we uh, mapped out the whole ecosystem right away. We, we took in like the municipalities, we took in the universities, we took in the the banks, the IT companies and, and other clusters as well. So it was like cluster to cluster. So we have always been with a big map of, of more industries because of this uh, connection to, to uh, what, to, what tourism, uh, you know, demands and also what tourism uh, brings to the uh, societies and the destinations that they thrive in. So uh, what happened like uh, and, and how we maybe put more focus on this um, in the in this situation that we have been now in like for this la last 18 months and, and, and unfortunately I think we will be in, in some time uh, ahead of us uh, also. Um, we did this um, kind of, uh, yeah, we, we decided to try out a really typical project that we have had ongoing since 2017 uh, and tried to put it online. And, and, and we invited not only the tourism companies like we have been like focusing on in this innovation project we call RATAR, the RATAR, uh, but we invited the whole, you know, we, we opened it up for, for more companies to uh, apply. Uh, and we, it was like 100 companies from all over Iceland were uh, participating at the same time uh, in this project. Um, and the project was focusing on, you know, product development, um, crisis management, uh, how, to, how to move from challenges to opportunities, how to implement sustainable uh, ways of thinking, um, and uh, kind of how to restart your mindset also. So uh, this is a lot of peer-to-peer, -peer. people are talking uh, together, uh, you know, exchanging all kinds of uh, ideas on, on how to thrive uh, through this crisis and so on. But in the project, we, we were so lucky to have, you know, uh, companies that, that were not maybe thinking uh, that 
they were a tourism company. I mean, they are not a tourism company, uh, all of them. But but like one of them are producing salt in, in Iceland. Uh, and they started out because the market was so good because of the tourists, of course. I mean, they had a lot of buyers, but then, uh, you know, uh, the, the tourists disappeared in, in the crisis and they needed to, to change the way of um, thinking and how they could produce and, and, and sell and, and so on and so forth. So, so the market in, in Iceland was already uh, the only market that they could uh, sell to. So they, they kind of changed the way that they were um, operating uh, and, and selling to the, the Icelandic market also, but, uh, and, and also producing for the, for the, um, the guests, the tourists that are, were coming in. And, and because of the tourists, they, they, all, they already, and, and they, yeah, then they, they got, you know, bigger markets here uh, and, and more buyers to, to buy their products. Um, one example was also uh, how, how companies were able to shift focus. Uh, we have one company that is producing tomatoes in Iceland. Um, and in 2018, uh, they started to get a lot of guests uh, asking about if they could come and, and, and visit them and see the, the, you know, the production and so on. So they shifted from being a tomato producers into being um, more of a restaurant and producing tomato soups and, and, and inviting people to come and, and take part of their, um, their chain of produce, uh, how they were producing. Uh, they put up like a, a farm of, uh, uh, all kind of things that they could show our guests that were coming and showcasing how their business was. Then the crisis came and, and they had no guests uh, coming, of course. So they had to uh, refocus their business uh, all over again. So they started to build back up the tomato production in a more in, in a higher scale so they could uh, transform back to being almost tomato uh, producers only, uh, and they did not lay off uh, any employees. Uh, they could have all their stuff uh, because they, they built a new greenhouse to, to be able to uh, produce more tomatoes. So mm -hmm. these are maybe uh, just two uh, really small examples on, on how you uh, are not uh, looking at yourself in, in, the, in the perspective of being uh, a provider in the tourism chain, but then when when things shift and and things ch things change, you you really need to adapt to uh, the new yeah. reality and, and and be able to run faster with that. Yeah, I think that you know demand always demand for change is something which really drives change. I see a very interesting comment now in the chat. I like the concept that the whole community be open and involved with the tourism after all, it takes a community. And I think this is a really great, great message. Of course, it takes the whole community to change something. And we also see that now, especially in this COVID situation where destinations or countries where they have uh, the spirit of, of community and doing solving the problems together, they're much more efficient. So coming back to my third question, which I, presented in the destination, which I really think it's interesting one is that, you know, can we, can we invite locals to feel like on holidays at the, their own destination, at their own home? Um, I was like, I was, I had a conversation about that with one of the tour operators in Slovenia and he said, oh no, Jana, no, don't go there. <laughs> we don't want, we don't want them to stay at home. We want them to travel. <laughs> I say, yeah, well, but you don't travel the whole time. You still, most of the time you are at home. So at least can I feel like I'm on holidays when I'm at home, you know, that means that maybe tourism suppliers will think about me um, customer and this is something what you completely um, you know support it with that you know you can do that you can change this reception and invite your locals to be your guests in a community um, I we had a very nice um, example of that you know it's before that we had we have this in Ljubljana 
a hot, the first hotel, which was built in the beginning of the 20th century, it was really this old, beautiful uh, place. And there was, it started as a place where locals would meet, you know, go for a coffee in the morning and so on. And then it grew to a hotel later on. So it completely changed the, you know, the, who is coming to this place. And now slowly, you know, they understand that the local community coming to this place and to this go coming for coffee is very important and they want to introduce them back. So I think that, you know, if we think about that a little bit more in that aspect, we can open a bunch of different um, opportunities also for the travel industry. So Milena, I will go to you now with the question because we were discussing this already and I know that you said yeah I will think about it a little bit more <laughs> so I'm really curious what you came up with <laughs> uh, yes so I'll start actually with the research that I did specifically on the topic so if we look at the um, at the theoretical space where researchers are looking at what are the psychological ingredients that form an experience um, during uh, holiday, um, it does turn out that it's, it's more about the emotions and the feelings rather than the physical surroundings. The reality is that our behaviors and the way that we um, uh, remember them and uh, um, their importance is determined by many internal factors, such as what do we, um, uh, our desire to go to a certain place or our previous knowledge and so on and so forth in our state of mind, but also to a large extent by the situation that we are placed in. Um, so in that sense, it is absolutely realistic to do tweaks in the design of experiences that already exist that are geared towards um, guests um, or visitors in a place to adjust them in a way that would trigger the same emotion and memory creation effects for locals. And I feel that most of us have already had conversations that are sort of anecdotal proof for that because most of us were actually restricted in travel. So we felt constrained um, to traveling within our regions, within our home countries. And in almost all cases, when I've spoken to friends and colleagues, people would uh, make the observation that they have seen a place or experienced um, um, a leisure experience that they were absolutely clueless existed in their backyard. And this is an indication that indeed um, within destinations, we can transition to um, leisure economies rather than tourism-based economies where the mix of offerings and experiences is both impactful and engaging uh, for locals and just in the same way it's uh, impactful and engaging for the guests that we have decided to, to invite and that also will also secure that authenticity which we always talk about as an important ingredient because it actually will be authentic because it will be just as you said it will be the coffee place where both um, locals come and also um, guests come so it will be a very natural um, mm -hmm. mix I, I Inga you were trying to yes. your hand <laughs> trying to say something else. sorry <laughs> trying to say something <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry if I uh, interrupted, but uh, but this is uh, this is uh, very nice, Milena, and it's very good thought, and it it uh, made me think uh, we were delivering the uh, the diploma for the certification in one destination here uh, not long ago, and they showed there have they have a mobility project. Uh, and it's mobility of persons, it's mobility of goods and, and, and a lot of different things where they have a mountain and it's quite uh, complicated to avoid the private cars. So tourism industry is trying to, to put up solutions and then they invite the inhabitants. 
elderly people who need extra transport, they have a certain type of schedules, they are also then driving their goods and they have put up their apps uh, and the only one who can sell things through this app is the local, uh, it's local purchases. And then they can take the, take the goods out for their uh, elderly people or others, busy people or, or whoever. But they said the interesting for us is not that tourism can go into the public transport, but that the people living there can use tourism mm. services and also support, uh, support their businesses and, and ideas. And I, and really I think like it's really... Mm -hmm. and, sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry, go, go ahead. Asta. No, I like the comment here in, uh, in the chat box that like in the last year or so, we saw locals being travelers on, you know, <laughs> in, in the local areas and in their destinations. And I think this will be so valuable uh, into the future also you know, to be more sustainable, not only that we are all going to stay home, but, but also, I mean, this will bring more diversity uh, and the destinations and the local businesses can maybe thrive through local, no, through low seasons and, and, and so on. So I think that uh, at least as for Iceland, I mean, we depended 90% of all of our guests that came to Iceland were foreign guests. So, I mean, the, the local locals were not, uh, traveling and did not have the mindset to travel in Iceland. I mean, it was just like if they really had to, they did it. But it was not like mm. it was not even like marketed to the local uh, people living in Iceland. But that ha has like changed like and hopefully like forever that people are mm. really, really enjoying, you know, the all of the the build up that has been going on and the development and they see that they can go and have so great dishes and, and uh, so good activities and so on. So I, I hope this will like change <laughs> for forever also. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also, you know, it's if we are talking about how to lower the CO2 footprint, you know, as we saw, the biggest part comes from the, and so if we eliminate that part and target also the locals, you know, that means that we are doing already some part of our strategic plan and meeting the goals. You know, I was like, even before the COVID, you know, when we were always having in, in Slovenia being a small country, for holidays, you would always go outside. This was like completely normal. You know, everybody would travel around, especially to Croatia for summer and stuff like that. So, but I have some friends in the Azores and one of them said to me, I asked them, you know, it's summertime, where are you going for your summer holidays? And he said, what do you mean? I'm staying in the Azores. I came through whole winter of rain and fog and everything. And finally we have good weather. We have a lot of people, we had really good life. <laughs> why would i go somewhere you know this is here is great now you know i don't you know no i want to stay here now you know everybody's coming here for holidays so i live on holidays so i think this is something you know so this kind can really trigger a lot of this better cooperation and really thinking about your local residents as stakeholders being involved in the process planning of sustain of tourism but also being your you know, your visitors, your partners in crime, <laughs> this is of the ones who you really want to have. And I think that if something COVID really showed us that this is possible, um, but maybe we should go to, we, I know that uh, we can uh, talk about those things, <laughs> the four of us for another hour or two or however, <laughs> but I maybe we should go and check what is in our um, questions and uh, um, box um for example how do you see art and culture fitting in would anybody like to answer the ladies sorry i missed the question uh you how you... do in the it's in the q a it's not in the yeah. chat Okay. Um, right. How do we? How do you see art and culture fitting into these green tourism objectives? Maybe Ingo, how did you address that in your strategy? Uh, 
To me, I think art and culture is a natural part of tourism, uh, or it is one of those players in the ecosystem that I, I was talking about. Uh, I think it's for art and culture, it depends. It's a wide, wide uh, area. It is still a transition for them into the green objectives. They are a part of the industries that go towards an, a, a greener future, like all other industries. So they are not accepted. But I think that uh, also connected to, to tourism, they can, uh, we can see that if you, if you make good connections between tourism and art and culture, you give the guests much more opportunities at the destinations much more to see, much more to experience, much more to, uh, to actually uh, dive into. And this could make longer stays. If, if you think very simple, you can think like that. Uh, and mm. I do. So, so mm. it, uh, uh, I think the diversity that art and culture can bring to, to the, the more core tourism players is very important also in the green shift. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And we, uh, I mean, we, we say that they are, of course, a really big part of the value chain of tourism, art and culture. This is all combined and, and we all need to go under the same umbrella in, in, in thinking in this green shift. I mean, nobody is excluded in, in that. Yeah. We need this actually to kind of, sorry. No, no, I just, no. I just wanted to build on uh, on that by saying that if we uh, make a reference on the previous point about uh, transition to a leisure mm -hmm. economy where we mm -hmm. mix um, residents with guests, that would be even more uh, more applicable mm -hmm. because art and culture on one side secure that authenticity that we are talking about because they they yeah. are a very powerful way of communicating and inspire and sort of inspiring the true spirit of a place but on the other side they also are um, the basis or the ground for leisure experiences which are relevant for local residents and could be relevant also for uh, for guests mm -hmm. Yeah, I think definitely that, you know, especially when it comes to culture, you would target, you know, your local residents, primarily, especially with, I don't know, theaters in events and something like that. So you need to build on your local residents to be the consumer of that, you know, offer of culture. And only with building on that, you can, of course, you, of course, target also the, the tourism sector, but you have to have your internal cultural, you know, actions going on constantly and developing and so on so to make the whole destination interesting on that part as well but Thank let you. us go we don't we, have, we also have like 15 minutes left so going back to some questions do tourists traveling to slovenia and using green tours or participating in sustainable tourism know how they have minimized the negative impact of their activities or help reduce their carbon footprint or support local businesses quantitatively? Do travelers care about the ANU certification? Yeah, this is always a very hard question, of course. Um, I think um, yes, to some extent, but not enough. You know, that would be a very short answer. We really try to, especially the way Slovenian tourism is communicating and promoting Slovenia as a destination on international market, we are always putting that sustainability and green story in front. So I think, and all the research also showed that the travelers coming to Slovenia are aware of that. And this is becoming one of the key uh, motives for choosing Slovenia because of this uh, green initiative and really the green commitment, let's say so. So yeah, they definitely understand. They the the level of uh, communicating what their impact is is of course not sufficient because it's not measured in the way as it should be and i really we will all closely watch 
the results of Norway um, and <laughs> build on their experiences. <laughs> um, so, and of course, do then the next step and make people really aware of what their, what their role is in this. Um, and I would say that uh, asking if they care about the certification, I'm not really sure that this is the very, the, such an important question. I think that we are going to certification. Um, the main motive for going for certification is because you want to change your operation to more sustainable. And this needs to be the primary goal, not that because of you have a certificate on your door, more people will knock on it. You know, this will happen automatically because you will start to target different, different businesses. You will change your uh, different uh, visitors. You will change your operation and your position on the market. And, you know, you will have your employees more satisfied and so on and so on. And that will bring also the the end of people really understanding. But I don't really think that, you know, it's so important that travelers understand it, you know, and say, okay, oh, this is a you know, certificate, I go because this is a certificate. I, need the, I think it's more important that they recognize the green practices. And I'm sure, Milena, you are nodding your head and I'm sure that you, I know you agree because this is something what you engage. And I think it's something what we were talking a lot about is, you know, how to change that uh, one of the things which we need to do in this, in 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 this on this subject is that starting to change the default options of tourism into more green. So that means that it it is not saying to our tourists you need to travel more green, but we need to embed in their program green um, um, green offer or not just offer, but the, the way they act um, already in. In the sum in the product in the product itself and make them travel more green not as a choice but as a default setting so yeah i give the floor to you <laughs> thank <laughs> I'm you i'm sure you have a comment <laughs> yes actually one of the one of the things that we have to recognize as an industry is that uh, yes travelers increasingly care about sustainability whether it's uh, translated into certification or not but they don't care enough um, to take to to be the main decision maker when it comes to sustainability. So we um, we also have to recognize, and that's actually a, a discussion that Oster Christian and I just had when when I was visiting in Iceland. That we have travelers um, that are just coming out of a crisis associated with the pandemic. We cannot possibly think that the, the effective way of engaging them in our sustainability efforts is by hitting them with another crisis. So we have travelers who are suffering from crisis fatigue. So we actually have to make sustainability the default option, the easy, the fun thing to do in a more natural way, rather than keep the weight of the decision on their shoulders. They're, they cannot be the active decision maker when it comes to um, selecting the most sustainable option. And actually, Jana, referring back to, to this living room idea, which I love and which I feel is exactly what we should be seeing more of um, with the shift that we hope to see, um, it's actually the destinations and the ecosystem of businesses that need to be the ones who set the norms because this is their home, this is their um, cultural assets, this is their art, this is their living space. Um, so they, as you, as you framed it, if you invite people with certain terms, then they naturally fall into behavior, which is good for them. It's good for the place. And then they have this good um, uh, feeling of having done something good without actually having made the effort. And I know that mm. probably it doesn't sound morally ideal, but the reality is that travelers go on holiday not to save the world, it's a nice thing to know that they are also helping the, those efforts, but it's never going to be the main worry um, on their shoulders when they leave home to uh, vacation. Yeah. Ingrid, you were trying to say something, yeah. 
Yeah, I was just thinking we have been running some tests on, uh, we have uh, have uh, some tracker who is asking some questions and, and, and questions raised the last years have been, would you consider uh, changing your way of travel due to uh, climate concerns or due to environmental worries? Uh, and then we have looked at the different markets and how they tend to to be quite different in answering these questions. And then the next question then would be a battery of, would you fly less? Would you uh, eat more local? Would you, a long battery of questions. And it's very interesting. Uh, you can feel like a nerd when you look into it and see which uh, nationalities are the most concerned for this and this. And, we did a test in Norway uh, this uh, this year, not long ago, and I just uh, remember the uh, the interesting thing about that is that we we investigated the the, the group the age group, and this is really something that's very interesting because uh, uh, it was really a big difference in the age group from. 35 and up, and then for those below 35, and how they would change their way of traveling. So this is uh, something we should notice. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, I just remember they were way ahead, uh, the younger, when it came to willingness to change and, and uh, the feeling of mm -hmm. needing to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Asta, you are trying to say something, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> no, I totally agree with Inken in this. And I think that we are working really similarly in, in many ways and in, in trying to encourage uh, the business owners to see this and be like leading in this, not, not waiting until this will be like a legally, you know, instrument in, in, in some ways. But I think also we need to make it maybe shift from the from the individuals here because we of course want people to change and, and put their mindset into this and, and make this you know uh, you know amendments to the companies that they behave in a sustainable way and responsible and everything like that um, but also and I was having this great talk to Roy and Renty from uh, the DTS uh, just like the other day and we were talking about this I mean this is in a, in a bigger scale because in the value chain or the supply chain the bigger players are, are putting out demand to their um, uh, in their supply chain. So they are not having business with companies that cannot show how they are responding in a sustainable way and what they are doing in, in this corpor corporate responsible ways, how they are measuring the, the ways that they are doing business in a sustainable way. So I think that companies that are not doing anything today will not be in business after two years. So we need to help the business owners how to understand that and how to keep them in shape and keep them proactive, not wait until it's reactive and then they are lacking all the knowledge and all the, all the ways to do this. But we need to make it more fun also. I mean, this is so demanding mm. and boring and you just have to do a lot of things and it's complicated and we need to like, keep them and with the 10 percent or or whatever measures we have to do it we need to get them on board and, and make this something that people are not like feeling that this is uh you know all of it is, is so demanding and, and boring this needs to be a little bit fun because when you see that the business gets better and the employees are much more prouder to work with you and, and for you when, when you are doing things in, in the right way, then you see that the effort is, is clearly, you know, making you more money and business and, and, and so on. So I think that we need to shift maybe the mindset and the focus uh, to get people on board uh, to do this. Like Milena was saying, I mean, people are getting so frustrating on, on every pandemic. We are trying to put this into this costume of, of horror in a way so yeah we are all the try trying to change some kind of behavior of somebody you know and i think this is really good this is a really hard process to do and i was really impressed with the the way that iceland was doing the the ac uh, academy for the visitors with those fun videos mm -hmm. and trying to you know bring the fun into something which is a very 
you know, not so nice thing, don't mm-hmm. do this and don't do that, mm-hmm. you know, and bringing this uh, little bit different approach will, mm-hmm. it's much easier to, com- you know, to make people, to come people, to make people come on board and say, yeah, this, you know, of course I do it like that. This is fun and this is cool. Mm-hmm. And this is the same as, you know, the living room concept, you know, yeah, you know, you, <laughs> you want to have fun program, <laughs> fun mm-hmm. things to say and, you know, get people on board so Milena I think you were trying to say something as well no or, no, or no no I was just no, no. nodding I, was, I thought that you were <laughs> you're just nodding okay um maybe we have we have five more minutes uh maybe we go to one more question and then we wrap it up um do you think that in the post pandemic keep the local communities interested in local tourism also referring to the idea of making local feel like on holiday, what are your ideas for funding local businesses to actually be able to create physical space for those people who many times a local can go walk on the same promenade? To me, this audience requires a separate amenities to keep them entertained. So who yeah, wants to I go? think when we talk about local, we are we are maybe talking about broader places. I mean, like when I say travel locally, I'm, I'm more talking about the whole country or, or within a bigger region and, and try to be creative about the product development that you are having. I mean, uh, when you're just having foreign guests and new people coming, you know, every year, you don't have to be that creative in your product development. But this maybe demands more of the companies to think more about how to bring out new ideas, how to... So the DMOs and the company owners, they need to maybe be in more cooperation about how to how to market new mm-hmm. things, how to how to innovate and how to how to spread people or or the yeah, the the ideas around. Yeah, we had an we had an interesting experience in Slovenia for in the COVID period. Um, every citizen in Slovenia got a voucher for 200 euro, which we can use in uh, Slovenia for tourism, for accommodation with uh, breakfast or something like that. So that means that we actually saved the season. Uh, but it was, it is something which definitely, and of course, the numbers of tourists, the locals will go down next year, I'm sure, because, you know, they will not have that vouchers anymore. But I think that the experience we had travel locally and you know experience things locally many people as i think milena already said is that they kind of saw that there is so many things interesting you know in slovenia it's really small um, that it's still worth exploring and maybe instead of going on a on a short break um, on a weekend break fly i don't know to somewhere maybe I can spend this short break in Slovenia. And I think that this is some, this is a bit of thinking that is staying after, and I hopefully is staying, but it also depends on how the tourism industry will react and how the destinations will react. This is something what they will actually push forward also in the future and create products and experience which are going to target locals in that way and that we can stay as an important market for local uh, economy, more more important than we were before. I think this is something which can be to some extent achieved. Mm-hmm. I have two minutes left. I don't want us to go over time. So I will ask you if there is something each of you would like to say as a closing, free to do it. I would like to hear it, what you have on your mind. <laughs> So <laughs> we started with Ingun and we will finish now with Ingun first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I feel that I was presenting a very heavy t- uh, theme today that, uh, that really is not the first one to push um, just after the COVID, but, but I'm very happy that all of you have engaged so much in the theme and that we have made uh, interesting discussions also and very nice questions from you, the audience. So I feel quite confident that uh, we are going to slow and try small steps at a time for this. And uh, it's no theme I have felt so much willingness to cooperate on 
as this. That's good. <laughs> great, <laughs> great. Asta, to you. Yeah, I think like one said, like here in the comments, this takes a community to, to bring on and we need to make everyone involved in it. And this is something that we need to do all together. So I, and it can't be fun because we will, you know, succeed and, and that, then we will have a better planet. So it's not like a choice. It's just like a really good project to be working on together. So thank you for okay, this great. opportunity. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Where do I sign? <laughs> so Milena, back to you. <laughs> my, my closing remark um, will be that there's no question that um, amidst this disruption, we just have to change models and innovate. Innovation, uh, which uh, Oster talked about, is the key here. Um, there's an interesting framework um, that's called thinking inside the box. Um, which actually suggested that the best innovation uh, happens when we are restricted. So I think mm -hmm. that there's plenty of opportunities if we restrict ourselves in the thought of how can tourism serve our destination. And I'm sure that brilliant um, remodeling of businesses and services can come out of that, that can meet all the criteria that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really interesting thing, and I, I completely agree with you. You know, some we saw that now in uh, in this COVID situation, being locked into this really small box, exactly. so we had to be super innovative to first survive and second have at least some some fun still doing this. Exactly. So now I would um, really like to thank you, ladies, for participating in this panel. Um, and I'm really happy that we managed to connect through this. We know each other from before. And now I'm sure that um, we were able to share some of our thoughts, uh, which we were going back and forth already before and something. And I hope that we triggered some kind of thinking with our audience and that they found it interesting. So I would really like to thank you. Um, on the other side, of course, I would really like Thank you all, uh, and thank you for all the questions and comments in the um, um, in the chat. Uh, I can see that you uh, have you you put a number of really nice, inspiring uh, chats. So you know we, we, we will sleep good tonight. So thank you for that. <laughs> and I need mm -hmm. I still have some uh, guidance I have to give you uh, from the GSTC. So uh, we are now at the end of this first. And um, tomorrow for the third GSTC destination management workshops on natural areas and visitors management from 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Pacific time. Through case studies from North America, Europe and South America, participants will learn about strategies for visitors management in natural areas. We welcome you to engage with the GSTC online and, your, and at our virtual booth. We can also, you can also find more in, uh, information on the GSTC website. Uh, the GSTC criteria is publicly available and translated to many languages, as Kelly was already pointing out at the beginning. Immediately following this session, we welcome you to visit the virtual booth in the exhibition hall and also to place bids on a silent auction items during the lunch break. Uh, then from 1.15 to 2.30, we have our next panel, Shaping the Future of Tourism, so all very welcome for that some of uh, some of you will take lunch break some of us will take dinner break um, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe some even breakfast break and uh, then we can we meet again um, and in this panel the leaders of destination canada destination bc and the tourism industry association of bc will share how their organization have responded and how they are charting a path to forward to support recovery and shape a reimagined re future for tourism. Once again, I'd also like to say a huge thank to you all, to all our speakers for the, for the time today. Thank you for participating, for joining us and enjoy the rest of the summit. In case there are any kind of questions still for us, uh, I'm sure that you can still uh, post them and we will try to answer them also online um, and so 
thank you very much for listening and have a great lunch, dinner slash breakfast or just you know, a bit <laughs> of rest. Thank you. So bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>